Um, thank you everybody uh, for coming to this author talk today. My name is Trey um, and we are happy to have um, an acclaimed award-winning author of Christian fiction and nonfiction um, about the Amish way of life, Amish culture. And we're so happy to have her today. Uh, Suzanne Woods Fisher, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I am thankful for this technology that we can connect even during a time of, of uh, a complicated traveling. So thank you for joining today. And I'm going to give a presentation. And at the end of it, we'll have time for some questions and answers. And I would love you to just be thinking if you have any questions, you know, write them down and we'll see if I can get to them at the end of it. But, but to begin with, this is a conversation about the Amish and the Audubon Society's annual bird count. And I am going to, you might be kind of wondering, what do the Amish have to do with the Christmas bird count, which is a great question. And I'm actually going to get to that in just a few minutes. But first I want to focus on the Christmas bird count as a whole. And this year marks the 122nd National Audubon Society's annual Christmas bird count that I'll refer to now as the CBC. And it's um, you know, the 122nd for an obvious reason, even though this is 2021, because last year it had to be canceled, which is, which is so sad. But this year that is gonna be happening. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And ironically, the Christmas bird count didn't actually used to be about counting live birds, but it was actually about counting dead ones. And this traditional Christmas side hunt, which you can see in that, that painting on the left, it's, um, it's a painting of a pile of dead animals. And this holiday tradition, and we're talking about the turn of, of 1800, late 1800s, 1900s, it was a tradition that on Christmas day, teams would divide into two, and they, that was the sides, and they would go out into the woods on Christmas day, and they would try to kill any fur or feathers that crossed their path. And at the end of the day, the team, the side with the largest <clears throat> pile of dead birds, dead animals, was the winner, which is kind of shocking to think. But again, this was, you know, we're talking around 1900. People at that time just considered birds as a limitless resource. And you can see from the, the um, hats of these women, the feathers that are garnishing their hats, you know, just, it was remarkable how, how much they used these beautiful feathers. In fact, there was, a, hunters were starting to wipe out the snowy egret popula population in North America. An estimated 5 million birds from 50 species were killed every single year in the name of fashion. So sad, but conservation at this time was just beginning. It was in its beginning stages in this era and scientists were beginning to sort of notice this and becoming concerned about declining bird populations. So enter the scene was a man named Frank Chapman. And he was an American ornithologist. He was known for starting the bird count. He was a conservationist and he was also the writer and the editor for a magazine called Bird Lore, L-O-R-E. And this was, he was also an officer in what was not even then the Audubon Society, but it was sort of this the beginnings of a society of bird lovers. In 1900, Frank Chapman, encouraged all the readers of his magazine, Bird Lore Magazine, to that this year, instead of the traditional Christmas side hunt, he encouraged them to go out and count birds instead. So on this 1900, 27 people participated in 25 counts on that first year of the Christmas bird count, and they counted over 90 species of, bee, of birds. And thanks to the enthusiasm of Frank Chapman and people like him, um, this tradition began, oops, I'm sorry, went ahead, and I'm too ahead, sorry. Sorry, I have a very sensitive counter here, or mouse. Um, so his enthusiasm just 
created this, this wonderful tradition of the first annual Christmas bird count, which has continued for 122 years. So just to show a little bit of the impact of how, what it was happening now in the early 1900s, by 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was signed. And this was one of the, it was really one of the very first statutes, one of the first US um, wildlife protection laws in our country. And it made it illegal to hunt or take or steal or kill, capture even a bird's nest, bird's eggs of any of these, of, there was about 1100 migratory bird species that were identified. And it made it illegal to herd and take any of them. And this was part of the CBC and the now growing Audubon Society, which began in 1905, um, playing a role in America's growing conservation movement. So the purpose of the annual CBC is entirely scientific. Every single year, there are thousands now of Christmas bird counts that are taking place all over the United States, throughout Canada, Central South America, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands as well. Pretty amazing. And here's how it works. Every CBC has an established 15 mile di diametrical cir circle, a circular count area. And on a prearranged date, these registered teams, registered through the Audubon Society, they go out with an assigned volunteer observer and they count the number of birds of each species that they can identify within that assigned 15 mile circle. And every count also has a volunteer compiler that takes all the lists and inputs the total numbers for every species into the Audubon's Christmas bird count database. And today, it is the longest running citizen science project and wildlife survey in the entire world. And it's considered the gold standard of citizen science. You know, what's exciting about the CBC too is you do not have to be an experienced bird watcher by any means to join in on this. Anybody can participate, novices, you don't have to have any skills with bird watching, you just have to have, have, to have an interest in learning and I really encourage you, if you have any interest this year, they run from December 14th to January 5th, I believe. It's about a three week period. And in your location, I'm, I have no doubt there's Christmas bird counts happening. If you have any interest at all, you can go to my website and I have a link that will take you to the Audubon Society and you can just find out more about what might be going on in your area. But I really encourage you to do it if you're interested because it's a fun way to learn about birds and it's a fun way to meet interesting people too. So that takes us to the Amish. What does the Christmas bird count have to do with the Amish or the Amish with the Christmas bird count? Well, first of all, the Amish are actually the old order Amish we're talking about are, oops, I'm sorry, sensitive. The Amish are really sharp, sharp birders. Um, they are some of the sharpest birders in the entire country. And interestingly enough, an inordinate amount of rare birds are sighted on Old Order Amish farms or by the Old Order Amish. I will get to that in a, in a moment as to the reasons why. But I just want to point out the Christmas bird count is not about um, sighting rare birds. It's about sighting all birds whatsoever. But when it comes to rare birds, it seems to be they, they really enjoy Amish farms. So as I mentioned, I'll get to that in a second. First, I wanna give a little bit of a background about the Old Order Amish because there's so many misconceptions about them. The Old Order Amish actually began with a, they're an offshoot of a small Protestant denomination that began in Europe in the 1500s by a man named, a formerly Catholic priest man named Menno Simons. And thus began the Mennonites after Menno Simons. And these people were what they called um, Anabaptists. Menno Simons and many others like him um, believed in adult baptism rather than infant baptism, which seems like such a small thing in our day and age. But at that time, that was a deal breaker. 
And these little groups, cells of, of believers, were given the name Anabaptists, and they were heavily persecuted all over Europe. They were chased away from their homes. Their belongings were confiscated. They were, many were martyred in gruesome ways, like dropped in baths of boiling oil or burned at the stake. Um, and that distrust of government is still a part of the Anabaptists. When you look at the Old Order Amish, for example, they are um, isolated. They are not part of the public utility grid, other things like that, that you can see that that distrust of government is just sort of part of their DNA. Well, as persecuted as they were, these groups continued to grow and grow and grow. And, in, um, and they started to split and splinter as well. And you might recognize some of these names, the Hutterites, that's, there's a lot of Hutterites up in um, North and South Dakota, Canada, I think some in Montana. And they, are, they believe, they're Anabaptists who believe in communal living. Um, there are the River Brethren, the Apostolic, German Baptist, that was my own grandfather. He was raised plain in another name for his group, the German Baptist is the Dunkards, if that rings a bell at all. So let's fast forward to 1693. There was a Mennonite minister named Jakob Amen, and he believed that the church was not making enough disciplinary stands, and he introduced the concept of shunning when someone had a you know was in need of discipline. He created this idea of shunning, that became the Old Order Amish Church after Jakob Amen, and it's really important to remember that because one the Amish came late to this. They were the last group in, essentially, to the Anabaptists, and only the Old Order Amish shun. None of the other groups will shun. There's other distinctions as well, but just so you get an idea of, of who, how the Amish differ from them. So Pennsylvania now today, um, actually, there are no Old Order Amish in Europe at all. There are Mennonites, there are other groups, but no Old Order Amish in Europe. And it might surprise you, though, to learn that the Amish are the fastest growing population in North America, the fastest growing. They're not the largest, but the fastest growing. They are growing from the inside out, very, very few converts to become old order Amish. High retention rate and big families. Well, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Ohio had the largest Amish populations in the United States. And I'm gonna zero in now on Ohio, and in particular, to Holmes County. That's the little marker in red there. And Holmes County in particular has a, an, a large amount of rare bird sightings. Some bird populations that are declining in many other areas in the country, like kestrels, are actually increasing in the vicinity of Amish farms. So the Amish love birds, and birds love the Amish. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures I've taken of uh, Amish farms. These are purple martin birdhouses that you almost would never see an Amish farm without a purple bird, purple martin bird house. Um, they're almost like airports with the birds kind of zooming in and zooming out, like almost like little condominiums. And the reason for them is they are excellent mosquito eaters. So another picture I'm going to show you now. This is a one-room schoolhouse in Ohio, and I've had the privilege of being an observer in a number of Amish one-room schoolhouses, and they're just, they're just an incredible opportunity, a wonderful experience, um, just really lovely. And anyway, they, you can see the um, teacher here, and it was actually a male teacher, which might surprise you. He posted this uh, the, the birdhouse right outside, the bird feeder right outside the windows, both for feeding and for observing as well for his students to see. They call them um, the pupils. But anyway, and then here's another example. Um, this is corn shocking. And this too, I took a picture of this in Holmes County. And corn shocking is kind of considered a lost art, but the Amish will shock their corn during the winter to overwinter and it provides an excellent place for birds to find food and rest. And, but that brings us to why, 
why would there still be an enormous amount of rare bird sightings on Amish farms? And there's a couple of reasons for that. The work of the Amish keep them outside and they tend to be very attuned to nature. If I'm drawing a broad brush, I would say nature is a, a very big part of being Amish and appreciating nature. I think this is another reason is the horse and buggy. They're the chief means of transportation for the Amish. And when you're traveling country roads at a sl much slower pace than the rest of us, you're gonna see and hear things that you wouldn't in a car. That's me over to the right there. And it is, if you ever get a chance to get into a horse and buggy, it is such a, an amazing experience. Um, first of all, you do slow down. Everything just goes slower and you notice things. The only time it's terrifying is when a truck rumbles by because it is really, truly terrifying. But another reason we have for why there are more rare bird sightings on Amish farms, there are probably more birds on Amish farms. They have traditional farming methods that haven't changed as radically as practices on a commercial farm. And there are fewer pesticides and fewer herbicides. And without those insecticides, fields have, of course, more insects, which draws in more birds. Here's another couple of pictures of corn shocking. I just think it's such a beautiful kind of a, a poetic sight. So the Amish begin birding at an early age. They, they encourage young people to study them, to observe them, to record their bird sightings and activities in logs. It's a kind of a hobby embraced by the Amish culture. And it's one that the whole family can participate in. Another reason they love birding is it creates a lot of jobs for the Amish. They build birdhouses and bird feeders and they sell them at roadside stands and local cottage industries and even retail shops. They sell bird seeds and binoculars and scopes and accessories for bird watching. But that doesn't bring us to Holmes County. What is it about Holmes County that makes it so, um, so unique, so appealing to rare birds? Well, the Amish, they feed birds, they watch birds, they record what they see, they're paying attention. And the answer is simply that with all those trained eyes and ears during daily activities that are so alert, if you have an unusual bird or a bird call, it just rarely goes unnoticed. Rare birders tend to find rare birds. And here's an example. But before we go to that, um, the Amish are always quick to point out though, that Holmes County is a, a wonderful place. It has a rich variety of habitat that's conducive to the area. So the Amish would be quick to point out that it's not just their keen awareness, but there are dense woodlots and brushy fence rows, and there's croplands and streams and ponds. And, and there's even this, the state operated Kilbuck um, Marsh Wildlife Area that's part, it's an important migratory waterway. You, you probably know this, but there are four almost like highways in the sky for migration for birds. And these birds will go, the Ohio is right over one of them. So a lot of, lot of variety of birds coming through that attract a wide range. So in now and then, some birds end up being really rare. And that brings a story about a little tiny bird named a northern wheat ear. This was in September of 2009. This little wheat ear had been blown off course during a storm. It was making its way, get this, from the Arctic, where it summers, all the way to the tip of Africa, where it spends our winters. And this year, it, there was a storm that really knocked it off course, really off course. And there was an Amishman named Emery Yoder that noticed this little bird on his wood pile and he was just experienced enough as a birder to realize that this was no ordinary bird. So he found out quickly what it was. Word soon spread over the rare bird alert, which is something the Audubon Society has easy to do, telephone or internet. And over the next few days, hundreds of people came through to see this little northern weed ear. They would just line up quietly and take pictures and notice it. And the little bird seemed to just enjoy the opportunity to be on display. He stuck around for a while. He was probably exhausted from the storm. 
So this little bird, um, not all people are as gracious as Emery Rioter was with this little rare bird. He even had a guest book for people to sign in, which was so kind. But the Amish are often the first rare bird just by recognizing its bird call. As I mentioned before, they're considered some of the sharpest birders in our country. One of the things the Amish do also is they have birder clubs. It's become such a popular pastime for young people that they have, they form this, these birder clubs. And the Amish generally are not people who join things like this. So it's kind of a big deal. They, they just support this. They love giving kids this chance to um, spend time learning about birds and enjoying nature and focusing on birds. And that brings me back to the popularity of the Christmas bird count among the Amish. I have a friend named Cheryl Harner, who was the former president of the Ohio Audubon Society. And she would, be, would want me to point out something that is um, going on, on these Christmas bird counts would be the men and the boys and the teenage boys especially. Women and children, women and young girls would not join into something like that. But the Amish men and teenagers will. And one thing that I find kind of interesting is that the teenage boys in Ohio will bicycle the 15 mile radius. They, it, and maybe you already know this, so forgive me if it's common knowledge to you, but every Amish church is a standalone. There is not an overriding hierarchy of Amish churches. And there's at last count, it's probably more but now, but the, my latest statistics, there's about 1,900 Old Order Amish churches in North America. Every single church is a standalone. That's why you have so much variety among the Old Order Amish. They certainly share a lot of cardinal values and lifestyle and choices. But there's a lot of variation from, you know, prayer caps to to whether a cell phone could be okay used for business and across the street, you would be under the ban for it. So in another church. Um, so Lancaster County only allows scooters, not bicycles, but Ohio allow the, the Amish churches there seem to be fine with bicycles. So you'll see the teenage boys zooming around on their bicycles, which I think is kind of just fun. I, they're endlessly interesting to study about the Amish because there's just so much to learn. But before we get to kind of, as I conclude this, and then we can get to some questions and answers if you have any. In, I wanted to share a story about my own backyard and my experience with birding. So this happened just a few months ago in April. I, our backyard has a lot of redwoods. I live out in California in the San Francisco Bay Area and we have a lot of redwood trees in our backyard. And there was this, a couple of years ago, my husband put up an owl box, took a while for the owls to come, but they did. And this little Western screech owl has set up housekeeping in the owl box. And I noticed her in April, which was great. I, I loved it. She's come a couple years in a row. I just loved hearing the little cooing at night. Um, the Western screech owl and the Eastern screech owl are, have the horns like the great horned owl, but they're about half the size of the great horned owl. They're not big owls. Well, I um, was so happy she was back. And then a week or two after noticing she'd arrived for spring, I was out in the morning and I, I was actually fed the dogs and I came back in the house by our slider and I saw this little ball of fluff. And if you look at the bottom picture, that's what I first saw. And I have to be honest, I thought at first maybe it was a rat or something. And then I looked closer and it was a baby owl, this little gray ball of fluff. It was about this of like a softball, but clearly a little baby. Um, and it, it must have fallen from the owl box and hopped during the night its way all the way around the house. And you have to, it's almost like an L shape and, and all the way up to the back door of our house up on a, up on a deck. I'm amazed it got that far. But it did, and I, I kind of spent the whole day thinking, okay, it's gonna hop back, or maybe its mother would call or somehow get to it and let it know, you know where home was. And I kept the dogs inside and the children, grandchildren inside. And I just kept hoping something would happen because I could tell this little bird was disoriented and scared, but nothing happened all day long. And so as the afternoon wore on, I finally called our wildlife museum hospital 
and they were outstanding. They told me just what to do. So here's what we did. Oops, sorry. We called my son-in-law, James. James was a college baseball pitcher and has very long arms and he's not afraid of heights. So he came over and he brought my little granddaughter who's two years old, Annie, and using gloves, he scooped the little baby into a container. And while he was doing that, my husband, he set up um, a big tall ladder in our backyard and oh so gently James climbed the ladder and he just slid the baby into back into the hole of the owl box and it's kind of funny he said that he heard some scuffling clatters inside like a noise you know and, and all we could think is like the mother saying where have you been all day but anyway the baby owl seemed to be accepted the wildlife museum had told me to watch carefully for the next 24 hours because if the baby was rejected, we'd see it out again. And if so, we had to get it right over to the hospital. So I was paying attention, watching carefully, but everything seemed fine until about a week later. We woke up on a Saturday morning and some crash against our window, followed by like flapping noises. And we, I jumped out of bed and went to the window. And then there, Believe it or not, this is the baby owl. One week later, it's just amazing how feathered out it is, how much bigger in one week's time they grow so quickly so that they can get up and going. And you know, the cycle of life for a bird is so, so fast. So he hung on the screen for quite a long time, kind of looking at me as I looked at him. Happily, I got some pictures of him. And then he took off. And it was. We have not seen any of them since. So I think they were kind of think it was his inaugural flight. You might be thinking that maybe this owl wasn't the brightest, but I kind of like to think he was just um, stopping by to say thanks for saving him. So this was such a fun little moment in our life, especially because it had kind of a beginning and an end, which is so rare, especially with wildlife. It's usually just a brief encounter. But for Christmas, I actually made this a, a storybook. You, for my children, I mean, grandchildren, and I, um, they just arrived the other day and I'm kind of excited about it, but it was just such a fun, neat experience. And I love that our backyard was home to all this. So that, Mike, brings me to, obviously I have a love of birds, um, to this book, which is the reason why I'm here today, A Season on the Wind. And it is about a little rare bird. This one is a, a white-winged tern, which is very rare for North America, but it, it um, or the United States. But there actually has been a sighting in Pennsylvania where my book is set. And this little bird ends up on an Amish farm and he just turns life upside down because everybody wants a glimpse of this bird and he has a knack for eluding people. There is an Amish teenager in this book named Micah Weaver. And I, I just think he's one of my all time favorite characters. Um, Micah works as a field guide for avid bird enthusiasts, both Amish and non Amish as well. And in between each chapter of the book, I created a bird log, which would be something you'd see in any bird watcher's life. They, they keep a track of when they saw the bird, where, um, what time of day, you know, the habitat, any notes about the bird. And it's just, just kind of part of bird life. But the thing that's fun about Micah, one, he has kind of a funny sense of humor, but he also has a speech impediment. So Micah doesn't talk a lot but he does listen very well. And that's actually one of the first lessons of birding is being a listener. So if you wanna find out more about Micah, about birds, you can get a copy of A Season on the Wind at your library. You can get it at your favorite retailer. You can also, if you wanna stay in touch and um, you can go to my website, SuzanneWoodsFisher.com and by signing up for a newsletter, you can get a, um, a free gift and it's, uh, I promise I'm, I don't overdo it with newsletters, but it's kind of a fun way to stay connected and get to know the latest updates and, and even pictures of what's going on in my life. You're welcome. Consider yourself invited to do that. And with that, I am going to pass this back to Trey and we're going to see about any questions you might have. Thank you so much uh, for your yeah and your talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, go ahead and just write it uh, out in the chat. Um, you should just be able to type your question out and we can get them going. 
uh, while we wait for those to come in, uh, let me go ahead and ask. You, uh, you're obviously very, very interested in, in birding and birds and, as well as the Amish. Um, did those uh, interests arise? Were you interested in the Amish first and then through their love of birding came to love birds or the other way around or are they completely separate? Well, I think that's a great question. And I would say, so my grandfather was raised plain. He was a Dunkard, a German Baptist. He grew up outside of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on a, a big farm. He was one of 11. And there came a point in his life when he chose to go to college. They were sort of running out of farmland, which that was in the early 1900s. So imagine even now more so with the reason people go west. He ended up though, he was an intellectual and he went to um, college and had a career in publishing. And it was, but as I mentioned, only the order, older, old order Amish shun. So the German Baptists would not shun someone for going to higher education. Um, the Mennonites obviously wouldn't, the other groups don't. So we have stayed in close contact with my many, many cousins who are Dunkard, something, there's a colony actually out in Modesto, California, not far from where I live. So I've, I have had an interaction with my plain relatives who live, I think such an admirable life. I've always seen a genuine, authentic, they're true to who they are. They would, they wear the garb that's not unlike the old order Amish and they will drive in cars and they do ride in airplanes, but they would not have a computer in their home. They would not have a radio, a television. And they, they just hold true to a lot of the values that have been part of their beliefs for hundreds of years. So I saw that, I saw that in even some family tragedies and how they weathered them and handled them. So to answer your question, I think I had a genuine belief or interest in the plain people. I'd say, you know, plain meaning all the simple people, the plain and simple people, the Anabaptists. And then as I started writing about the old order Amish, my agent was the one who knew of a connection of my grandfather. And she connected me to a, an editor at Ravel and and thus began my writing of Amish fiction, um, I, I just started observing what goes on in the Amish life. And the birding is a huge part of it. It really is. So from that, kind of one thing led to another and another. And I am so far from being anything more than enthusiastic amateur, but I really, really love it. I mean, the more you know, the less you know. And it's just, it's just such a fun thing. There is such variety and everywhere you go in this world, everywhere, even Antarctica, there are birds. So it's, it's kind of fun. It's hard to, uh, hard to turn it off once you learn more. It's, I have all these bird feeders out on my back patio now. And hummingbirds go hubbing by to get too close to the feeder. They come in to scare you off. And it's just really, I'm trying to incorporate it into my grandchildren's life as well. Um, have you personally seen any rare birds around your house? Well, they're, they're probably all rare to me because <laughs> I'm such a, such a novice at it. So no, I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything that would, you know, be on a, a lifelong birders list. Um, there is a, a, a movie called, a book in a movie called The Big Year that if you're interested in birding, I would really recommend. It's a, it's just a great story about people who are really into birding and sort of a year long competition. The big year, I think it's called. Um, we are still waiting for some questions to come in, but uh, let me let me uh, get another one to you. Um, how did you start get started in writing? You know, I appreciate that question. I've been writing probably from college on. It had taken root in me as like this is what I wanted to do, and I uh, was on the college newspaper, and then I, when I was out of college, I worked for a, a uh, journal of political philosophy, in fact, it was kind of a lot of older men in a think tank and wrote and wrote and then started married and had a family. And we've lived actually even all over the world with my husband's work. And I've always kept writing magazines, a freelancer all over. We, um, the internet was just beginning as we moved to Hong Kong and I was able to keep my contacts and write from there. And it became just a wonderful I, I love to write, but I always thought I was a nonfiction writer. I just, I had developed those research skills. I had, you know, 
the interviewing ability. I had, it just felt like that's where I was. And then we came back from Hong Kong as my kids were heading off to college and my, um, I think my dad was starting to show signs of Alzheimer's. You sort of had that sense of a storm clouds on the horizon a bit. And I just thought, okay, this is, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go with writing at that point. And I came to the conclusion through a couple of different circumstances that the only one holding me back from writing a book, a novel, was me. So I thought, well, I can just I give it a try. And so I, I actually spent about four months writing, 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 did not even tell my husband, my sister, no one, not my kids. I just, it just felt like a personal project. Wasn't sure it was ever going to go anywhere at all. But um, at the end of four months, I finished this novel. It was a little, just that first draft, which is so drafty. But I, at dinner that night, I told the family, I, I have written a book. And I'll never forget this kind of quiet. And my youngest son, and you know how sensitive boys can be. He said, that's why there's no food in this house. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. You know, For four months, I really was ab just completely tunnel vision. But I had a book and I um, polished it and polished it and pitched it and pitched it. And it's such a hard industry. It is, you, you just have to want this so much because not only are people not um, looking for you, they're almost looking for why you shouldn't be there when they read your work. But a, and even with all the context I had, it did not open a door. But I did get an offer from a little um, small, pub, small royalty publishing house. And that works so well. It was how I, I'm so glad I started small. I just believe in small beginnings. And I was able to kind of be, I wouldn't say a big fish, but a medium fish in a tiny little pond. <laughs> Learned so much as I went that has helped me forevermore. And you know, especially about the marketing and promotion side of writing, because that is half of writing books is really half of it is how you get that book out there. You can't rely on your publisher to do it of, of any size publishing house or budget. The author is still responsible for a lot of it. So that opened the door, won a couple of little awards, easier to do when it's small. And with that, I um, caught an agent's eye and then the agent led me to Ravel and thus began, I think I'm now into I think I'm past like book 35. I, I should count that, but I don't know. But it's, it's been such a gift and I'm so thankful. And it's been wonderful. Even just to connect with people like all of you who I never would necessarily get to meet, especially during a pandemic. Uh, we have a uh, question here from Ann B. Um, she says, uh, how is your relationship with your grandfather uh, since you are not uh, plain? Well, my grandfather, he passed away a long time ago. But he was, um, remember, he wouldn't, he was the one who left to pursue college education and then a career. And he was not shunned. He, that would only be the Amish that shunned. So the German Baptists, kind of like cousins to the Amish, like the Mennonites are, they didn't shun at all. So there was such a warm relationship and, and uh, open homes and, and loving care and and that's continued on with the other generations as well. There's always, each time I travel, they will make an effort, the different cousins to come wherever I am and see the event or just connect. So all good there, but I appreciate the question. Uh, Donna Murphy asks, how do you come up with uh, the ideas for your books? Yeah, that's such a good question, Don. That's, sometimes it's like throwing spaghetti against a wall and, and hoping. To see. But the bird book, for example, with, I think it was actually that little northern weed ear that I'd read about long ago, and I just, it was in the back of my mind, just the idea of a little rare bird on an Amish farm, but I put it aside because I had other books I was working on and came back to it, and then, you know, one thing leads to another and another and another, and the Christmas bird count I factored in because I'd learned more by that time, and then it was ready for a season on the wind, and and uh, all kind of came together, but I, it's, everybody writes in different ways. And I have one friend who's an author who I admire so much. And she is the, the breadwinner for her family, which might have something to do with it because she has a full-time job and she writes full-time, but her mom lives with her too. So that's helpful because the mom, you know, is wonderful in, in uh, providing everything. But my friend will take three weeks and do a complete 
complete like outline of the entire book, scene by scene, within each scene, the point of view for every single character. And it's amazing. So then when she goes to write, and she will allow herself three plus weeks to write a novel, you know, it'll be six weeks altogether. She is ready to go. It's, I'm just amazed at that. Because to me, I sort of love the surprises along the way. Sometimes I'll stumble onto a whole other thing to learn about and it opens up a whole other you know, direction, but brings me back kind of to the end. At, at the end. I don't know if that helps or not, but. <laughs> um, you have written uh, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, which would you say that you prefer? So I'm, I think that's an interesting question. I think in my heart, I'm a nonfiction writer. And so some of my favorite books have been the books in which I'm pursuing, for example, Amish Peace, Simple Wisdom for a Complicated World, Oh, I love that book. I, I really want it in my coffin, kind of love. You know, I, I feel like that was one of my best things that I've been able to write. And it was, it gave me this foundation for studying and later writing about the Old Order Amish. And that was, that was actually my first contract with Ravel. And I went out cold to Amish farms in Pennsylvania, in Ohio. I went to Elizabethtown College and interviewed academics about the Old Order Amish. It was just this, I learned and learned and learned and then created, um, found stories and with permission, though names are often changed, created stories about all these different themes of the Amish life. And, um, and I love that. I think that's just probably my, my best writing in some ways. Though the characters are fun, like this Micah Weaver and putting, um, especially like those bird logs and putting a little bit of his humor into how he thought and think. It's so challenging, it's fun. So characters are fun. Um, so you've gone out to um, Amish farms and talked to people and got your research that way. Um, I imagine, you know, most, most fields, um, it's become easier to do research with the advent of the internet, but the Amish don't have that. So uh, are you still primarily doing your research by, by actually going out to the places and talking to people? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I really am. And keeping those relationships going and healthy and staying connected to them. And um, I mean, the pandemic has made everything harder. So, you know, if we kind of put that aside a little bit other than writing letters. But for example, as Christmas cards come in, it's so fun to get Christmas cards from, from Amish families. And I'm so thankful to have relationships that are good and, and healthy and, you know, that they, they trust me, um, that I won't write anything about them without their permission, as well as if I do with their permission, it will be done the way they'd like it to be, you know, they're represented the way they'd like to be presented. All right, if there's any more questions from the audience, uh, you can just write it right in the chat. You can direct message me. I'll be able to see that, those questions. Um, in the meantime, um, a, the, in your book, A Season on the Wind, the, the rare bird is a white winged tern. Yes. Is that a real bird? Yes, yes. All the birds that are cited in this book, and there's many rare birds mentioned because Micah's got an unusual gift for, for birding which is something I kind of have learned about, about the Old Order Amish, that they will go out into, when they're birding, they do not use technology the way the non-Amish would. They're not using their eyes to call birds in. They're just, they have a patience in allowing the bird to come to them. So I learned a lot about how Amish specifically bird, though they will have expensive scopes. I mean, they have great equipment. <laughs> but they don't use um, tricks to bring a bird in. And I, um, so all the birds that are in the book have been sighted in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County. So I really worked hard on all that research. It might seem like a lot for a year though. I have to admit that, <laughs> but, but it is fiction. <laughs> um, when writing series, when do you know, do you know going in that you're going to be writing a, a series of books um, or do you get finished with one story and then you just think, I have to keep going. I need to 
do more with these characters? Well, usually it's contracted as a three book series. Okay. And so what I have found now, the season on the wind is a standalone. And I have to be honest, as an author, standalones are so much easier because <laughs> keeping a story going, an umbrella story, because you really mm -hmm. want each book to be a standalone to, you know, to earn its own way. It's right and being your bookshelf. But um, so you want a complete story. I, I just get so bothered when I read the series and so much of the middle book is a is sort of like the backstory or setting you up for the next story. So I, I try to have every story really complete. But I, I think that middle story is the tough one because that's mm -hmm. the one you're trying to really keep the interest, keep the characters going, not just repeat a love story. I mean, you can imagine on television shows when a, they finally get a couple together and then they break them up and, and you know, oh, it's gone on too long. <laughs> you know, the series just should have ended. But usually, it's a three book series that will be contracted at one point. I think it's probably, if you do it well, they wanna see the characters come in, see what happens next, see where they're going, you know, um, maybe a character in the background will step forward or go off stage. Familiar faces are fun. I mean, it can be done so well, but it is not easy. I think it's one of the harder styles of writing. So I, I credit authors who can really do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Susan Beam. Uh, she says, thank you for your book, A Season on the Wind. She enjoyed it very much. She loves the okay. and all the facts about the birds from Micah. And her question is, uh, which series is your favorite? Wow. What? A, oh, that's like asking a favorite child. <laughs> I don't know. Well, how about if instead of, of saying that, even though, let me answer it in a different way. Um, Mending Fences is probably one of the best sellers, and I can see why. It is, it is uh, maybe one or two series ago, and it's a pretty, I wouldn't say gritty, but it's a story about a young man named Luke Schrock who had been in previous stories, and we last saw him where he was carted off to rehab for, and yes, this happens with among the Amish, and he was back, and trying to make amends. And so the whole book is really about him learning how to be sincerely um, apologetic and own his stuff and kind of really get back on track. And it must have really hit a chord because it's, it's I just got my royalty statements and I saw that it has been a, one of the best selling books I've had. So if you, want, if you want to try another book, I would recommend Mending Fences if you like the Old Order Amish. If you want to try something fun, I want to just, this is why I'd love for you to be connected to my newsletter. In the spring, I have a contemporary fiction coming out that's called The Sweet Life. And it's about a mother and a daughter who start an ice cream shop on Cape Cod. And just as a side note, my husband has been to ice cream school at Penn State and my husband's an ice cream maker. So there's a lot of research that went into this book. And I think it's gonna be one of my favorites of all time. It's just a really special story called The Sweet Life. I think I just noticed the cover on Amazon. It just went up. It is a gorgeous cover. All right, we'll look out for that. Uh, we might have time for one more question if someone wants to send one in. Um, if not, then uh, if... What, what's... It's great, Trey, thank you so much. To um, an aspiring writer, if, if someone was interested in writing, what, how would you advise they get started on that? I think going to writing conferences is the fastest, best way to get a really good view of, of the writing world, whether, you know, what it's, what's it going to take? What are, it's a business. So what are they looking for? And I think developing a sense of that is huge because you may have a one, wonderful book to write, but it may not be something that the rest of the world is looking for, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't write it. It's just that, you know, the whole marketing side of this is a pretty significant one. So I think just, you know, besides the editing and, and agents and all that part of the editorial side of it, I think you'd also get a sense of the marketing and promotion side of it, which is huge. So I think those writing conferences can't be beat. Best way to do it. 
All right. Well, I think that's going to be about our time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. To us today. Thank you very much. And how, hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. And for anybody uh, interested in more information about Suzanne Woods Fisher, um, we can uh, definitely get some links to her website up. And uh, again, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.